And then, and in this hemisphere, uh, these are two two giants. So it is an honor to be with you today. Um, so. Uh, I think what I was going to focus on, uh, not to sound too contentious, uh, is the future of truth and uh, the new journalism ecosystem. Essentially what is happening here is increasingly in the next several years, uh, I think the most important journalism will emanate from the nonprofit journalism space. That is heresy in some circles. I could be shot or just fired, I don't know, something for saying that. But um, if you watch what has happened here in recent years, uh, it, what has happened is the emergence of nonprofit organizations. In the US, the first, uh, when nonprofits go back into the 1800s, Associated Press is a nonprofit, Christian Science Monitor is a nonprofit, National Public Radio is a nonprofit. But for investigative reporting organizations, the first one was the Center for Investigative Reporting, based in uh, Northern California, founded by four unemployed journalists. Uh, uh, I started the Center for Public Integrity in 1989. Others followed, and today uh, there are close to 100 nonprofit newsrooms in the United States and that is probably a squishy number because how do you define investigative etc but um, I, I will um, essentially what occurred of course during that period is about technology uh, you know I remember it was very exciting in 1979 when we had fax machines uh, <laughs> and uh, we have progressed quite a bit. Uh, we had these big bulky phones that you know would, you know, you would get a hernia from uh, carrying, and then uh, mainframe computers in the '60s, and then suddenly we had personal computers by the late '80s, and of course in the early '90s the World Wide Web, and from all of those things, of course, is what uh, Rosenthal was talking about with data journalism evolving over time as the power of computing got faster. But, but what has happened here today is um, in 19, uh, sorry, in 2008, the Pulitzer Committee in the United States decided that independent news sites, not newspapers, in other words, not necessarily newspapers, would be eligible for Pulitzer Prizes. And in the next few years, uh, nonprofits began to win Pulitzer Prizes. Um, in 1998, uh, sorry, I keep saying 98, I don't know why. In 2008, uh, uh, it was also the year that four nonprofits were asked by Associated Press to partner and put all their content on the Associated Press Newswire. Those four groups were ProPublica, the Center for Investigative Reporting, the Center for Public Integrity, and the Investigative Reporting Workshop, which I run. But we'll start with, I'm going to show you a few things. The main theme today, besides what the topic, overall topic, is how there's a level of sophistication that is changed for journalism in general and nonprofit journalism in particular. It used to be that it would be very exciting to have a database and to do something with one set of data. Now, in my view, a really good investigative story has to have at least four or five sets of data that are different sets of data, different subjects. And the cross-meshing of that data will show something that no one has ever seen before and very few journalists have ever tracked over the years. Generally, that is not commonly done, as we know, not often done. Uh, um, and so um, I want to, uh, one of the things I wanted to show, um, I think that this is, thank you for putting this up. Uh, this is uh, from the Center for Public Integrity website, just won the Goldsmith Prize at Harvard University. Um, that may be the first time a nonprofit has won that prize. This is a story about black lung, you know, uh, coal miners getting sick and dying. And what they went through multiple data sets. I'm not going to go deep, but if you, it's called Breathless and Burdened. And it's about black lung, but it won the Goldsmith Prize. And the reason I mention it is 
In the U.S., we have a lot of transparency after Watergate and all the other things that have happened. But we have very little enforcement the laws you could drive a truck through for corruption. We have what I call legal corruption. And so this is a case where the coal industry bought off the lawyers and the doctors. They paid them to say, you're okay. You don't need to stop, keep working. What is the problem? You don't have, that coughing, it's perfectly normal to cough after coming out of a coal mine. And they did this year after year after year and these four, there are four center reporters who dug into the various data sets, records, legal records, court records, doctor records, congressional records, and they pulled it all together into this combined uh, product. Um, I will keep moving if that's okay. The, uh, the next one I want to, so if you are interested in this, I urge you explore it. But it is very interesting because it is a weaving of data sets. Another one is after the meltdown, uh, this won the George Polk Award, uh, which is a very prestigious award, award in the U.S. That, um, uh, that is given annually. This it was a story where uh, the Center for Public Integrity, a, a group of reporters, tracked the non-prosecution, the lack of prosecution of all of the turkeys, that is an academic term, uh, involved in the meltdown, all of the people that got rich and thousands of people lost their homes and they were never prosecuted. Virtually no CEO of any bank or company in the U.S. has been prosecuted for what is clearly fraud. And it, and it is the Obama administration and it is a very serious problem. Uh, this project goes through name by name the people that were that did terrible things and the fact that nothing happened to them. Again, man, many journalists and many data sets. Collaboration, in other words. Um, I will move to another one which is called Offshore or Secrecy for Sale. This is by uh, the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, which uh, Rosenthal was very kindly discussing our meeting in London. Uh, this group started with a hundred of, I call them Jedi Knights of, of investigative reporting, the best, some of the best in, in the world. Now it is up to 175 journalists in almost 70, 70 countries on six continents. This, I believe, and I don't mean to say it the way it will sound because I'm involved in something with this organization, but it, I think it is the biggest collaboration of journalists in the history of journalism. It involved 115 journalists in over 50 countries, 5-0, on six continents. And there have been now investigations, I have lost track, at least five or 10 countries all over the world are investigating people that have hidden, hidden their money offshore and avoided tax laws. Uh, it is estimated that one third of the world's money, which exceeds a trillion dollars, I forget the numbers, uh, one third of the world's money is never taxed. Folks, as you know, there are 60, 90 offshore jurisdictions. Rich people put their money there, so the major prestigious banks that, that I mentioned are also not prosecuted. And um, the uh, leader of the, the head director of the ICIJ, Jared, uh, from, Jared Ray's uh, from Australia and Ireland. He's done reporting on two continents now. He's working on his third continent from the U.S. He got a secret amount of 2.5 million records, so bank records. That had to be, they had to create an internal platform where all the people that wanted to work on this could understand it and it would be secure. The first one they created, it took eight to ten months, did not work. They realized it was too complicated, half the journalists didn't understand it, they threw it out. They started over and they built another platform. But can you imagine having 2.5 million records and then parsing it out across the world to journalists? That is a very complex project and unfortunately it has also brought two lawsuits. But it is still kind of interesting. Um, it has been a finalist for some awards, it's coming up for other awards, but it, I thought you should no, it is called Secrecy for Sale, and um, 
I think that you might find that interesting. And then the the major thing I want to shift gears. The the, the major thing, and I know the the great Sarah Cohen sitting out here, who oversees all data journalism for the New York Times, and is a friend of many many years, Pulitzer winner. You'll hear her later. But it is hard to overstate the importance today and the increased phenomenon of collaboration. Here we have a situation where nonprofit news sites do not have enough eyeballs. I mean, people going to their site. The conventional commercial media has some fewer journalists in their newsrooms. They, uh, I will not go into the, the dark parts of that story, we know that too well, but there are one-third fewer journalists in the U.S. today than there are commercial journalists than there were since 2000. So they need content. They have eyeballs. They need content. There's a natural confluence. There's a natural partnership of interest there. They need each other. And so uh, the first project uh, I wanted to talk about is the Coke, Coke Club. Uh, yeah, that is good. Um, that is probably, yeah, if you, uh, well, yeah, if you uh, scroll down, you'll find Coke Club. But um, there are these powerful billionaires. As brothers, they are the two richest family members together in the world. Um, I don't know their net worth, but it's very high. They own, uh, you probably know, KOCH. They, they own, um, yeah, they basically pump hundreds of millions of dollars into the political process. The story that uh, we initiated, we did it for over 28, sorry, two and a half years, 28 journalists, almost all of them students. Uh, I teach at American University along with running the workshop. And so what we found was we used multiple data sets. Uh, you click on Coke Club, if that's okay. It's not coming up. Okay. But anyway, if you go to this site, yeah, uh, on the right side, you, later you can look at this. There are about five data sets. We put up between four and 500 IRS tax records for the 89 nonprofits the Koch brothers were moving money to, to say that regulation is bad, climate change is a stupid idea, why do we need that? Did I mention they own oil and gas interests all over the world? Um, and we, we, our best story, we did a package of four or five stories. One of the stories, they blocked the Obama administration climate change law. How did they do it? They got people to sign a pledge. 400 people, all Republicans, signed it, including 100 members of the House of Representatives, 80, 80 of whom, four-fifths of whom had just been elected from the Tea Party, the extreme <coughs> conservative wing of the already conservative Republican Party. And those people signed a pledge that they would not support climate change, and they would not pay one penny for environmental regulation in the United States by any federal taxpayer money. That bill died in the House of Representatives. It's a very interesting story. What is not well known, because no one combined five data sets, was that the hidden force behind it was the oil and gas industry in general, but if you look closely, right before Obama's elected, all the oil and gas money in the U.S. doubles to lobby against him to do campaign contributions against him, to run ads against him, and of the leaders of that group were the Koch brothers. So our, we already have had a dysfunctional political process for many, many years. It has become paralyzed now. I mean, nothing can be decided about anything. Um, I will move to the New York Times uh, collaborative. We did, sorry, this story, the Koch Club, we partnered with uh, uh, the New Yorker magazine, Jane Mayer, and she published the same day we did. She loved the climate change story. We had done all the other work, and you could see the whole package either either place. She linked to us, we linked to her. The next one, uh, the New York Times did a project, uh, page one of the New York Times on a Sunday with us. We had a shared byline, our filmmaker in residence, we do documentaries and books and other things. 
Our filmmaker in residence had a joint byline on page one with the Times staff reporter, and that project, the, the whole, it's called the whole, it's on that list of projects. That, anyway, eventually you'll, you'll see it. Um, that project we found from government records that the, you know, the U.S. already has the worst solitary confinement of, in prisons in the world of any country on earth. The U.N. says the U.S. is worst. What is less known is solitary confinement in, in, in uh, immigration detention centers is also quite bad. And in any day in America, there are 300 uh, uh, immigrants being held in solitary confinement, sometimes for weeks, which is inhumane in anyone's book. Did the world know this? No. Did the Obama administration ever discuss it? They have dealt with the amount of detentions. Did I mention that? And so that is a story that was very, very useful because no one had seen the data and the documents. But the New York Times did it, we did it, and the New York Times did not have the story. We went to them, they wanted the data. We had already gotten it, we partnered. The next one um, is Frontline. We, we have a general relationship. Uh, if, uh, somewhere, if you go down the stories, you'll see Frontline uh, about, about bacteria, about, um, I forget the name of it, but it, we basically found that NIH, National Institutes of Health, had close to 10 people die from a bacteria that ran through it in about a week or two and killed people, and even the premier hospital in the U.S. could not handle it. The problem, the filming was all over the world, including India, and uh, we worked with them. Frontline works in our, our office. We have a, two offices and facilities for them. And then lastly, uh, we have a reporter we have hired with the Washington Post jointly, a Pulitzer Prize winner. The Post called me and said, we hear you want to hire Mike, uh, you want to hire John Sullivan. And I said, yes, I hear you want to hire John Sullivan. And I said, you don't have enough money. And he goes, neither do you. So we said, let's split the salary. So we have a three-year memorandum of understanding. He is on the investigative team of the Washington Post. He's a senior editor for me. He's on the faculty at American. And he teaches five grad students inside the Post newsroom. And they are getting bylines. That is the first time a metropolitan paper, to my knowledge, has ever done a joint hiring. Um, and the, the point of all this is that collaboration, collaboration, and your, Sarah is going to really nail this later. <laughs> Uh, I, I hope, I'm sure she will. I'm sorry, to, I shouldn't have even used the word. I apologize, sir. Um, but um, lastly, the two big points I want to make, uh, the Investigative News Network was created in 2009 at a meeting of 20 founders of nonprofits. And uh, I was involved in that. Uh, uh, and um, today, that organization has 100 nonprofits that are members. and. There's all kinds of possibilities. I was hoping it would not just be a trade association helping the nonprofits. I actually have a dream someday that there'll be shared content that is accessible and the first time it can be an anthologized version of the best investigative reporting on planet Earth could actually be seen on a regular basis easily. I think it's a matter of time, really. Um, and then, of course, the Global Investigative Journalism Network as you all know, there was a conference down here last fall in October in, in Rio, I mean down here in South America. Uh, and uh, that was the eighth gathering. There were 1,400 people in attendance, the biggest in the world that's ever happened, convened of investigative reporters. The next one is in Norway next year. Um, but what we are seeing here is a, a coalescing of energies, uh, collaboration across borders, but also collaboration with journalists and collaboration with commercial and nonprofit together. There are 18 reporting centers, newsrooms inside the US. Mine is the largest reporting center at a university doing original content, but there are 18 in the US. 10 years ago, that would not be the case. Five years ago, it would not be the case. There might have been one or two. The first ones in the US were at Berkeley, University of California, Berkeley with Lowell Bergman and Brandeis with Florence Graves and uh, a, a longtime journalist who created the, an institute there. So that is where we are going and that's not just here, it's globally and I think it's a thrilling time and uh, I, I'm happy to be here.